Uh, good, good afternoon. Okay, got it, yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much indeed for um, joining this meeting today, Intelligence Forums, with Nicholas Gruen. I'd like to start by thanking Nicholas Gruen very much indeed for speaking today. Uh, Nicholas Gruen is a policy econo economist, entrepreneur, and commentator on the economy and society. He's the CEO of Lateral Economics, a visiting professor at King's College London Policy Institute, an adjunct professor at UTS Business School, and a patron of the Australian Digital Alliance. There are many, many things I could say about Nicholas Gruen, but I won't because I'd be speaking longer than he would be. So I'll leave it at that. But thank you very much indeed for speaking. I'd like to also say that if people wish to put their details in the chat box, please feel free to do so. I'd like to also thank Maria Colson for being in the chair and everybody that's joining this meeting. And now enough of me and over to Maria Colson. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Um, I'm going to um, start the conversation with uh, Nicholas Gruen in just a moment, um, but you may, may have noticed unusually for these meetings, um, we're going to be recording it. Um, if you have an issue with that, or if you are asking questions that you would prefer to be withdrawn from that recording, please let us know via the chat box and we will accommodate that. Um, it's not going to be used out in the public domain, my understanding is, but Nicholas likes to have recordings of the work and things that he's contributed to, so I hope you're all okay with that. Um, you'll all be familiar with the process. Um, Al, uh, Nicholas is going to talk to us for 20 minutes and then we will get you to do introductions if you, as and when you have questions that you want to put to Nicholas after that. Um, I hope that is okay. So Nicholas, um, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Maria. Um, and I hope, is it a nice day over there? Well, we're well, all, probably all in different parts of the country. Where I ah, am, well, there we are. Gray. It's amazing, isn't it? What's going on now? It's uh, it's good. Well, it's been a nice day here. But anyway, you don't need to hear too much chit chat from me from from down under. Um, so I'm going to talk about democracy, and I think I I think I've got something to say about democracy um, in a in an unusual way, and and it's like this that my um, I, I'm an economist and I'm a fan of uh, not so much the way economists have built their discipline, but the uh, the way in which economics is a very, it, it utilizes very simple ideas. And that's one of the reasons why economics can be um, a menace to the world, because people get these simple ideas and they take them all a bit too seriously. But if you can come up with a very simple idea, it can take you a long way. It can allow you to see a long way uh, and, and see quite powerfully. And I think I have, after a lot of thinking and improvising and uh, so on, I think I've come up with a way of thinking about what's going wrong with democracy, because I think a great deal is going wrong with our democracy. And... Um, I wouldn't be nearly so interested in this subject if I didn't think that I could pair the diagnosis to a response. Um, so let me tell you something about what I think the problems are. And, and in a way, the, the three emblematic uh, things that my country went through in, in this story, we were I think of the United States, the UK and Australia, I think ours for various reasons is the more functional democracy. Uh, two of the main reasons for that is we, we have preferential voting, not first past the post, which is extremely arbitrary. And we also have compulsory voting. And both of those things focus our politicians on the centre rather than feeding their base. But the thing that really went wrong in Australia that concentrated my mind uh, went wrong quite a long time ago, and that was uh, 2013. And we had spent about 15 years um, developing a, a pain, painfully developing a political consensus 
that we should have carbon pricing. And um, the eventually the, the conservative side of politics came around to this and we implemented a, carb, a, a carbon pricing regime, which uh, I was actually speaking to the architect of this earlier this afternoon, and he said it was the best in the world. Now, it was, it was I could tell you lots wrong with it, but that's what democracies are like. They don't produce perfect gems. Um, and it was the best, the cleanest, the best designed carbon pricing system in the world. And of course, it became a good political tactic for our then conservative opposition to say how terrible it was, and they abolished it. Now, I then asked myself, what proportion of the parliament, what proportion of the parliamentarians, which as you will recall, uh, uh, we send these people to parliament to represent us and to try to get to the right answer, what proportion of the people in parliament would have thought that keeping Australia in carbon pricing was a good thing? 80%, possibly, um, maybe 85%, maybe 90%. So that's an extraordinary thing that our democracies are doing immense damage, that, that, that the people who are elected to parliament are doing things that they know are wrong and would rather not do. But the way in which one has to build a political career in a party and so on means that they basically maintain party discipline and they proceed to do this. Now, you, some of you may have a different view to me that Brexit was a bad idea economically. I have no real problem with Bre if the if British people want to take a, a standard of living that's four or more percent lower than it might otherwise be in order to uh, have a different sort of setup. But that's not really how I see Brexit. I see Brexit as a kind of a hit job uh, a very ugly kind of uh, political hit job. And again, it involved the parliament about what, well, I don't know, you tell me, maybe 70% of the House of Commons thought this was a bad thing that they were voting for. This is a pretty bad situation. And uh, the United States, well, if you're a Republican, you now, I mean, and this is, re this is really true, uh, this is true towards the end of John McCain's uh, tenure as a congressman. If you don't believe in fairies, if you don't, if you think that climate change is real and that human beings are, cre are helping create it, well, you have no, you, you're not going to, you're not going to be pre-selected for the Republican Party. So we have, if you like. The, the sort of humiliation of the elites on which this system is built. So how did it get to this? Well, a simple explanation, a simple way to think about it is to say that, uh, is, is, is an analogy. I say it's been fast foodified. And what I mean by that is if you think about, um, if you think about fast food, fast food's pretty healthy in lots of ways, but it's got too much salt, too much sugar, too much fat. And as we get more and more used to it, it actually turns into a subtle kind of poison. And that's essentially what's happened in our political system. We have a, uh, on each, for each party, you have a, an army of professionals and they are, uh, with all due respect to them, some of them are very nice, decent people and they are professional manipulators. And we are now in a situation where, where if you watch a, I mean, you just go and watch uh, Nixon versus Kennedy in the candidates debate and any debate on TV now and any debate on TV now, it might be a little better in the, in, in the United Kingdom, but it's not really a debate. It's, a, it's two candidates or more all having rehearsed talking points and whenever, whatever question they're asked, uh, they know that the game is to, to revert to those talking points as quickly as possible. Um, so, so that is the situation that we're in. And it's also a situation in which there's a sort of, there are lots of things that we know that, that educated opinion and even, even 
lay opinion would be okay with, but um, it's very easy to run a scare campaign against it. Uh, nuclear power is one of those examples. Uh, uh, in the United States, being tough on crime is another one where they just sort of tip more and more people into the jail in, into the uh, into the jail system, and everyone knows it's crazy. Everyone knows it's wrong. But no one, no politician can really break ranks too far because that then sets them up to be, uh, to be exploited, if you like. Um, it sets people up to knock them out of the competition. And um, so, I've, so I now think of democracy as as a, a three-legged stool. And, and what I'm going to do now is I will compare Athens democracy, uh, the first democracy we know of with modern democracies. And the three-legged stool is the first leg is direct democracy. And all, de all democracies have an element of direct democracy. The Athenians had a, not a huge amount of direct democracy, but quite a lot more than ours. Ours is a one vote in Britain every five years, in Australia every three. In um, Athens, it was a vote every month in the assembly. You went to the assembly and you could argue, argue it out. Uh, and this was citizens and that meant, uh, that meant men uh, and not foreigners and all kinds of stuff. Um, so it was quite a lot. There was quite a lot more direct democracy, and I don't. And certainly, if you read Athenian history, uh, I mean, I think a democracy that lasted about two hundred years isn't a bad record. But uh, they certainly did some. The assembly certainly was capable of, if you like, being fast foodified. A lot of Greek discussion was about um, it was about you know the power of rhetoric and the power of demagogues to whip people up in in the assembly. But the Athenians, uh, and, and then if you want to have a large, if, you, if you're in a large, if, you, if there's thousands and thousands, millions and millions of people, you've got to have a way to represent the people. Now, people, one of the things people say about Athens is that, you know, Athens was small, so you could have direct democracy. In fact, Athens had more representative democracy than, uh, more representative democracy than direct democracy. The place was run by the boule. The that was the local the closest equivalent is the local council. It maintained the buildings. It prepared the agenda for the assembly and so on. And in of course modern democracies, there's the legislature. And there's a really big difference between these two. And those are the two. And these are the two other uh, uh, feet of the stool. Uh, legs of the stool. Uh, so the first leg is direct democracy. Each member of the democracy gets a vote, gets a say, a direct say in some sort of way. And these other two ways of representing the people produce a group of people who represent the people, a small group of people who represent tens of thousands of people in Athens or, or um, hundreds and th thousands or millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions. Uh, and pretty much all we do in our system is we have what I call competitive representation, which is representation by election. And so ingrained is that, that we cannot imagine that you could have a democracy that didn't have elections. But let me tell you, the Athenians actually did have elections, but not many. They had elections for the strategoi, the generals. Their political system did not lean heavily on elections at all. So how did the boule come into existence? The boule came into existence and, and various other things, uh, various other institutions. Um, the boule came into existence in the same way that juries come into existence in our legal system. And it, when you think about it, why do we trust a jury? Because in a very different way, it represents the people. How does it represent the people? Well, it's, it's not representation by competition. Nobody competes to get on a jury. And generally, the people in the jury don't think it's their business to, 
kind of grab hold of a, you know, to be on a faction and try and beat the other faction. Um, so the psychology inside this, these institutions is extremely different. And so I call that representation by sampling. And, um, and of course, there are lots of suggestions that uh, I think now there've been about three or 400 around the world. Um, uh, what do you want to call them? Sort of um, uh, pilot exercises in which citizen juries uh, very much chosen like, like normal juries have uh, are convened and then we ask them what they think. Another way to think about this is that a jury like that takes you from the opinion of the people, the, the approximate opinion when they go into the jury, after they think about the issues and discuss it with each other and argue with each other and persuade each other and hear from experts and so on, that moves to the considered opinion of the people. Now, on the question of Brexit, I can tell you that on the evidence, the difference between the opinion of the people, which we know on that day was 52-48, and the considered opinion produces a swing towards remain of about 10 or 15%. Uh, now, quite apart from, uh, now if you somehow in some um, magical way, strip yourself of the idea that you have, you, you, you've made up your mind on Brexit. If you didn't know what the issue was, would you rather go with the opinion of the people or the considered opinion of the people? Well, I would like to go with the considered opinion of the people. So I think this has a huge, I think, uh, I don't sort of have the time to go into chapter and verse, very happy to, to do more of that in questions. But I think that this, uh, I, and I'm not suggesting we throw out the mechanism we have, the mechanisms we have, because if I were, was, no one would care what I thought anyway. But I think that these kinds of mechanisms of democracy by sampling can be immensely detoxing, immensely healing, strategically positioned um, around our democracy. I've spoken to uh, uh, Graham Allen, who was a member of the House of Commons and, I, and is now a sort of, well, when I last spoke to him, which was before the Great Plague came upon us, but uh, I, when I last spoke to him in London, he was a, a kind of a, 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 an elder statesman trying to influence other people in the House of Commons. But he talks about a process with bills where you have a, uh, as part of the second reading debate, it goes to a citizen jury and the citizen jury learns about the bill and reports on the bill and so on. Um, that's one thing to do. There are lots of other ways you could use this system to, to infiltrate it into our existing system. Uh, but I suppose to focus this, uh, just to give you a for instance, a, a, a decent for instance of, so what the hell am I talking about? What would I be happy with? Imagine a system which looks exactly like your system does now, House of Commons and House of Lords, and we have an additional House of the People. Let's say that we put 200, maybe 201, it'd be better for procedural reasons. Uh, it's an odd number, easy to get majorities, um, uh, of randomly selected Britons, uh, and they would, they would be paid to, and, and they would be rotated, let's say, every year. Uh, and let's give them no power at all, except the power, a power a little bit like the House of Lords, or, but in fact, even less, which is to deliberate, to vote, to express views, to investigate. And I think it would have a just that with no power at all. Hard, hard to believe you could this could be a mistake of any kind. You, the worst it could be is it wouldn't, wouldn't achieve much. Um, I think that would have made it quite a lot harder for Brexit to happen. Uh, and I think a body like that, when you saw the swing on it, because it's not at all uniform, lots of things you don't get a 
particular swing between the opinion of the people and the considered opinion of the people you do there. I, 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 you do on climate change issues. Uh, so for instance, in a citizen jury in Texas, run intriguingly enough when George, uh, George W. Bush was the governor, he was on his way to the presidency and the citizen jury, they ran quite a lot of citizen juries in Texas and they were trying to promote renewable energy. And going into a citizen jury, 54% of people said that they would pay a little bit more, it was a small amount more for renewable energy in their electricity bill. And coming out, 82% said that they would be prepared to do that. The psychology of what they've been through, the experience of what they've been through, faces them not with the competition and the desperate desire to protect their own position, but a but a desire to protect their own position in a much more generous context of a society that has to make a decision that people, most people are going to be comfortable with. So um, that's given you a sort of a shape of what I think we should be trying to do and might be a good place to stop. And then let's see if we can get a good conversation going. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Really interesting um, perspectives. Um, before I go out to the others, I'm going to be very naughty and ask you a question myself to kick things no. off, if I may. No. Um, you talked about we could adopt it, um, a house of the people with our existing um, House of Commons and House of Lords. If it has no power, the House of the People, how would you ensure that the House of Commons actually took any notice um, and, and actually took the views of the House mm. of the People? Yeah, well, well, I, I'll tell you what. I, I mean, the, the, um, I feel so confident about this that I think I, I, I'm a believer in that scene in, if you're trying to bring about change, I think the most powerful example is what we saw in a particular scene in a movie called When Harry Met Sally. And a woman says in a cafe, I'll have what she's having, uh, if you remember the scene. And I think when people see how, how much sense they're, and, and they'll be a bit irritated by how some of them are a bit silly, but, but what happens is the silly ones kind of get corralled by most of the other ones. And when people see it, I think that'll be powerful. Now, it wasn't easy for Theresa May. It was easier for Boris Johnson because he managed to got, get a larger majority, but it wasn't easy for Theresa May to navigate that process. Um, so that's my first answer. But but I think it's quite, it's quite likely that if you had it there and that the Commons took no notice of it. And I think it is more likely that the Commons takes more no, no notice of it in your system than ours, because in our system, we have a House of Commons called the House of Representatives, and that usually has, that usually is a decisive, uh, it has a decisive majority for the government. And then the government has always got to negotiate with the Senate to get its way, uh, because it never has a majority in the Senate. Um, now, your House of Lords has a delaying power. So, so those are some of the reasons why the, the little, the, the little, um, little handholds, you know, climbing up the mountain, little handholds is all you need in a democracy to swing little balances. Uh, but I'd say more than that. I'd tell you a little sneaky power that I would give them. <laughs> so they would have no deliberative power at all. But how about this for a power? If they disagree with a house they can impose a secret ballot on that house. And imagine what that would do. Okay. Thank it you. would stop, it would, it, would, it, would, um, it would make it much more difficult to corral this elite, this group that we have elected to help us run our affairs, to make decisions against their own conscience, which is the problem that we are facing at the moment. Brilliant. I know that um, people are probably itching to ask their own questions. Um, I'm going to ask you if you can please put your hand up if you want to ask a question. Um, I won't necessarily see everybody on screen. So if I don't catch you straight away, just keep waving at me. 
um, and we will get to you. Um, Tom, you were had very quick to put your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Why don't you was, introduce yourself oh. very briefly, everyone, when you are, are about to ask your question? Um, yeah, so I'm a, a copywriter, researcher, uh, getting published by a think tank that also has MPs assistance writing in it, and also I'm a trustee of a children's charity. So my question is, in this third chamber, if debates required access to classified information to be fully informed, how would you manage the vetting so that it didn't exclude far left and far right views? And see what well, there would be no happen. vetting. We don't do that on a jury. You, you just select randomly. You probably want to do stratified selection so you keep selecting randomly until you've got the right demographic mix. So you always want between 52 and 48% women that women and men. You want a decent age profile, uh, but uh, you don't you you don't do that. You don't uh, that's that's for parliament or political parties or anything else. You just say that this body is to represent the is to represent the people by sampling from. And and if you don't do it that way, you get a huge bias. And in fact, I said to Harry earlier, could I play a video? And I want to, uh, so I might do that right now um, uh, because it helps me make a point. Uh, so I think this will come up on your screen. Are you seeing it? We are. So um, some of you may have uh, heard of a rugby player he was captain of the Australian Rugby League team, the Kangaroos, but he played for St Helens for a while over there, and his name's Mal Meninga. And he went into politics. And I want to play you his first interview. Here he is arriving in the station. It was his first radio interview as a politician. Seemed to be going okay. And then something happened. Why are you standing? No, a number of reasons. Um... I guess throughout my sporting career, I've had the, the urge to do community work. And I think I've, you know, I've really worked hard on that aspect uh, in my 16 years in Canberra. And the thing about that is that I was, I guess, a public figure. And I was put a, on a, as a, as on the podium where I was just a person out there making sure that I was, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm buggered. So, so Marilyn Malinga is leaving the studio and says that he can't do it. Mel Malinga. That's a. I'm very moved by that, um, and that and that's a person who, who wants to contribute, wants to be a politician. I'm trying to oh, unshare my screen, and he's not naturally self-assertive in that way. He's not well educated, um, and he can't put up with all the bullshit that he's got to go through, uh, and the. And, you know, the Athenians had a word for this. And our democracy is so estranged from itself, so estranged from the people that it doesn't have the word, even in an English word. And the word in Greek, in ancient Greek, is segoria. And what it means is not freedom of speech, but equality of speech. And if you don't have a sample, if you don't have any political democracy by sampling you get you, you get um you get the population represented by the by the, uh 95 percent of their representatives have university degrees and speak in a certain way and less than uh, less than 50 percent of the people they represent have university degrees these people are highly self-assertive. They're a certain kind of person. And we are, I mean, I find it quite extraordinary that this word diversity is on everyone's lips, but this kind of diversity is not the diversity that everyone's talking about. And yet it's the diversity that's tearing the world completely to, to pieces, uh, completely to pieces. The people who have been, who are not as, who are not university educated are simply enraged. Uh, their, their speech is policed. They're called racists, blah, blah, and blah. And um, that's because our system 
has become less and less capable of embodying this value that the Athenians felt was vital to a democracy. The, 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 the idea that everyone feels that they have a voice in this democracy, that their speech is equal to anyone else's. Tom, I think, Tom Bolster, I think you had your hand up. Yes. Now I might have, I, can, can I just say, I don't know whether that was a good answer to Tom's question. Um, I, I, maybe I've gone, got myself so rhetorically wound up that I didn't answer your question, Tom. Did I, how did I go? Well, I think it's, um, it makes sense that there's, there's that wider representation of people that wouldn't normally come in. Yeah. Um, but the question I would ask is, would it be possible in certain circumstances for people to know fully what they were deciding on if they didn't have all the... Oh, that's right. You asked about, yeah, you asked about yeah. classified things. Well, I mean, my understanding is that anything that's highly classified won't actually be shown to the legislature. It used to be. Um, it isn't today. It'll be shown to a small clique in the executive. So, uh, but anything that should be, th that anything, anything that can be safely shown to a parliamentarian should be available to uh, these people and they should get the same sort of services that a parliamentarian will get, which is a research service, the whole, the whole box and dice. Hopefully, Tom, that's answered your question. Um, Tom Bolster. Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm a competition lawyer um, and I help companies and individuals um, recover losses when they've been the victim of price fixing or uh, companies abusing dominant positions. Um, et cetera. Sounds good. Sounds yes. Good. Uh, we work a lot with economists. Um, in, yeah. In that field. yeah. I've given evidence in those sort of cases. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Um, yeah. So my, my question, I just was thinking, Thinking of a couple of examples of, of um, perhaps one that's very close to what you were saying, and one perhaps a bit less so. But I'll start with the latter. And um, Switzerland, I'm not I'm not an expert, but I gather they have lots more direct involvement. They have um, referenda very regularly. Um, mm. So I don't know what your your views are on, on that as as a kind of halfway house. Um, but then more recently. Um, I'm, I'm aware that in France, um, Macron, when he was faced with the, the Yellow Vest movement and riots yeah. in Paris, he essentially, if I've understood correctly, set up something very similar to what you've said. And I, yeah. I can't remember, again, how effective that was, but I was wondering what, what your views were on that as well. Yeah, OK. Um, well, I'm a bit unusual among people who think that this, this process called sortition or what I call democracy by sampling... Um, well, you've heard me, Maria was a bit surprised that I was sort of uh, happy with starting off not giving it a lot of power. But what I don't like is these systems being set up by the existing system, because the existing system has an absolute reflex for only doing things that are going to, they're going to be able to spin well, control, and so on. Now, I think, uh, I don't know the D, I know, I, I'm aware that Macron did this, my own experience with this is that this doing this is better than nothing, but I want to engineer situations where sampled bodies, bodies selected by lot, have a role and they can say that they, they, they're going through real time with the government, with the parliament, and they can say, we don't agree with you. We don't agree with you on that vote that you've just had on what we said six months ago or whatever. I think that's very important. Um, now, you had a second, oh, and then you talked about um, referenda. Um, I actually think, <laughs> I, I think Britain might be interested in whether it thinks referendums are all that democratic. Um, it, it had a recent one that didn't seem to be a huge success from the point of view of democracy. And I think that I, I have this idea that we're rather we're rather um, or we rather flatter ourselves in our understanding of democracy. And the way it goes is that we're very sentimental about our own role, and we always say it's those politicians who lie to us. 
why would the politicians lie to the people? Might it be something to do with the fact that election after election, politicians who told them the truth, for instance, you've never had it so good, haven't done so well? So we're all part of this. We're all part of this system. And, and the thing about referendums is that it generates the same kind of hype, the same kind of fast foodifying that I'm saying we need to do something about. Uh, now, it turns out that the Swiss have such a, a deep political culture that they can do these things. And I don't want to tell them they shouldn't be doing them, but they seem to have enough, a, a, really a very deep political culture, uh, lots of different organizations, lots of parties, lots of ways of getting information around, and it seems to work very well. Certainly in the states of the United States, quite a lot of um, quite a lot of states have in their constitution uh, uh, citizens initiated referendums. And what happens there is that powerful people engineer uh, referendums that sound great, like Proposition 13 in California, uh, which was a freeze on rates. Uh, and the result was that California went from having the best education system uh, in, the, in the United States to chronic bankruptcy in government throughout the whole of, of California. I'm sure that's a simplification. But uh, so those things can go pretty horribly wrong. I'll just leave you with one further. I'll, I'll leave you with one further story, which is that in Oregon, Measure 71 was a measure for mandatory sentencing. And mandatory sentencing things are very, very popular. Uh, and I'll tell you what the mandatory sentences were. Uh, on your third felony sex offence, you went to jail for 25 years. On your third or maybe it was fourth drunk driving offence, you went to jail for three months. Now, on those simple descriptions, 70% uh, of people from Oregon supported those measures. I would support those measures knowing no more about them. Are they, but part of the Oregon, so from since 2011 in Oregon, they actually have another part of the citizens initiated referendum process where they have a citizen review. What's a citizen review? It's a citizen jury of 24 people. They sit for four days and they explore those measures. And they did a review of measure 73 uh, on mandatory sentencing. And, the, and their job is to each write out a pro statement and a con statement and say how many people ended up voting on each one. Now, if, they were, if, they were, if their selection was representative of people's views, 70% of those people when they went in were in favor of it and 30% were against it. And after four days, the citizen jury voted against the measure by 21 votes to three. Uh, so I trust that far more than I trust. Uh, and then the people of Oregon voted for the mandatory sentencing, uh, but they came right down from 70% and it was about 57, I think. So it was pretty influential, the citizen jury, but not influential enough. Um, I'm voting with 21 randomly chosen people from Oregon. I'm thinking they were more likely to be right than the three who, who having looked at it for four days, said it was a good idea. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, Tom, I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank um, you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Mark and then to Alistair, because I think you've both had your hands up. So Mark first. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, yes, thank you, Nicholas. That's uh, really interesting. Um, I'm wearing my ultra cynic hat today. <laughs> very, very appropriate. I've got my I've got my cynicism level turned up to eleven. If you want to go there, yeah. um, so you know, I, I I'm all for positive change, and I can see the value in creating a positive change, which is going to make. Um, decisions for the people better or make better decisions for the people. And I'm all for that. Absolutely. But I wonder what your 
thoughts are in terms of, uh, I'm going to call them career politicians hmm. who are happy to, to put their sail up depending on which way the wind is blowing. Uh, well, um, and how that you... might fit in to, so if we have, so just in my mind, we have um, decision-making or advisory decision-making coming from, let's call it the bottom upwards rather than the top downwards. If we've got a, the people putting forward this, there's 201 people, for example, putting this forward. But then at the other end of the scale, we have, let's call them career politicians who um, are there for perhaps their benefit rather than others. Yeah. I'm not saying that's everybody. Of course it's not. This. No, oh, well, I mean, it just sounds like you're more radical than me. I, I think that's, <laughs> that's right. They are. Um, all politicians are career politicians. No, six, no good politician is not a career politician. Abraham Lincoln was a career politician. The game of politics is to have a career, to acquire power and do something useful with it. And most people get lost in that process. But that's the game. And I think it's a pretty toxic game. Uh, we're part of it because we vote for people who tell us things that please us. Um, and I did a podcast with someone and it suddenly hit me the, the, the plot of King Lear. And King Lear, as you probably know, divides up his kingdom and he says, I'll give the biggest part of my kingdom to that daughter who flatters me the most. And that's largely the way the people respond to politicians. Uh, they get told they're hardworking Britons, they're this, they're that. It's never their fault. Uh, we're always going to give, it's always going to be, uh, you know, they'll always, we, we won't say, listen, uh, there's an election coming up. Uh, the, it was a war on in Ukraine and we're all going to, it's, you know, it's all very unpleasant, but we're all, we're all going to be paying twice as much for our energy. Uh, your living standards are going to go down uh, because your, the values you claim to have that's all they're consistent with. Well, no one's going to... So, so at that point, you get the career politicians and the truth tellers, and there are the, 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 the two sets don't, don't, uh, don't coordinate. So that's the game we've set up, and it's a pretty toxic game, but it's got halfway decent people in it, and it's the best we've managed to come up with, and it's taken us from subsistence to talking over Zoom in the space of 250 years. So, you know, it's got some runs on the board, but it's a pretty ugly story and it's getting worse. And I think there are ways to, uh, to kind of make it more realistic, make it uh, try to moderate these really pretty awful features. Thank you. Um, was that okay, Mark? Has that answered your question? Yes, thank you. I, I, I was conscious my cynicism level may have been at 11, but I suspect yours may be at 12, but that's okay. <laughs> well, well, the question is, what do we do about it? Can we make this, is this just a feature of the system, in which case we should all shut up and put up with it if we can't do better, or can we come up with ways to make it a bit better? And, and that's what I'm thinking, I, that's what I'm saying I think I can do. I, I'll, I'll add one other thing which is, um, I think it probably, you might have had the same experience in um, Britain since, you were the, since you're the originator of all these reality TV shows. Um, I was quite astonished at what a marvellous contribution, uh, well, it was called Australian Idol here, it was called Something Idol there. Um, what a fa or, and then the dancing reality TV uh, talent quest. It was really quite incredible how much talent this unearthed in a pretty stodgy industry and you just produce all these brand new stars uh, because the because it's a whole new way to select people and that's what uh, th that's one of the things that this would produce it would produce politically talented people who turn up via this pathway rather than the party pathway where now certainly in my country you don't the, the parties don't really have many people who've had a career and then in their 50s move into, into parliament. They've mostly been staffers for politicians and they move up the party and the, here they are as, uh, as, as our politicians with no experience of anything other than politics and spin their entire professional lives. Absolutely awful idea. 
Thank you. Um, Alistair, I know you've been waiting patiently. No, inter with interest, with great interest, uh, and not just to Nicholas's comments. Um, I obviously defer to him as a professor and so on. I'm actually quite familiar uh, from my own background of uh, especially the uh, Athenian democracy. Um, um, I, 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 I have to say, I'm, uh, he, you need to know, Nicholas, I, I advise companies on geopolitics, macroeconomics, and uh, global financial markets. Um, so a lot of this is very interesting to me. I actually, and I'm familiar with what you're talking about, not obviously in the, uh, the thorough way that you are, but I, I wholeheartedly endorse this approach. I find, I just add a comment. I do have some questions, but I add just a comment. I think it's quite interesting that if you could have a house of experts as well, um, which is in a way the way that what the House of Lords is. Could be, yeah. Yeah, that the interaction I think would be fascinating yeah. because the House of Experts could influence and interact with the, the people. Yep, yep. And so on. And, and I think, I also think uh, um, this model is almost more applicable to local authorities and in devolved authorities where the, the the fact is that the people really are qualified <laughs> they're almost experts too in their area they know where the yeah. traffic problems are where the issues are uh, those are comments i got uh, the one question i wonder my first question on your for you is which is the chicken and which is the egg? The media, you have, you have you've described it, it, we see it. I, I actually can't watch uh, these interviews, you know, and I can't listen to Radio 4 is the, the Today programme. Because, I mean, it's, it's just a, such a colossal waste of time. Absolutely. The, the, the interviewers, uh, to varying degrees, some are actually quite sycophantic, but most of them clearly regard with contempt the interviewee and the interviewee who even eminent ministers regard the interviewer as hostile and, and you described yeah. that very well. So I don't know which is the chicken, which is the egg. So, but let me, whilst you think about that, let me say, I'm fascinated what would be the issues in this new setup? And I, I think the three great political issues of the world are, and I have to do this uh, by uh, sort of majority. The, 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 the biggest problem is uh, the climate, uh, which is going to kill us all. So yes. that's, the second biggest is that half the population are oppressed in some way of the world's population to varying degrees. Uh, and I'm talking about women. It's, it's a huge problem. And of course- Well, it's I would say really it's much, wor much worse in the low income countries than absolutely, in the Absolutely, but world. you know, yeah. look at what's now happening in the United States. And the third priority would be uh, the, those, the inequality of opportunity, which so many people, and you have alluded to that, when you're talking yeah. about the yeah. university. And I, I would be fascinated if this new regime, I would imagine they'd come up with some pretty good answers on those yes. three issues. Yeah, well, well, you know, imagine I said to you, it's sort of 1990, uh, maybe make it 1980, maybe make it 1970, make it 1900, and I said, it would really be a good idea if it's back in 1900, it'd be less than 1% of GDP. And anyway, um, we are moving into a situation where we have a very a non trivial risk. We're creating non trivial risks of climate catastrophes. And it's going to cost you one, two, three, max 4% of your income, the amount of income that Britons seem to have 
surrendered through Brexit. Now, I don't. I think people would just, in a normal situation, they'd go, "Oh, okay. Well, we'd like to have the four percent, but we can't." <laughs> it's just not a big deal, uh, especially since the income is growing over time. So this actually means that they're going to, instead of instead of doubling their wealth, uh, doubling their income in thirty five years, they'll double it in thirty. 37 or eight years uh you know it's it's uh, so why isn't why doesn't it happen and one way to think about it is you you heard my stat about the way people feel in these two if you're if you've got a if you've got competitive representation people are on edge and they're they don't want to be ripped off by the other side who does who wants to be ripped off by people who you think are a bunch of barbarians basically which is <laughs> how many of us feel about the other side the, the side of politics which is not sympathetic with us no thank you i'm not going to have you ripping me four percent off me and handing it to your mates whether they're your mates in the union or your mates in in um uh you know in the boardroom uh so you're going to be much more prepared to fight for that that's just the psychology of it but it, there's much more to it than that, because if you're running a, a coal mining company, you don't have to give a lot of money to some people to start sowing doubt and to start saying it's really all, uh, you know, for to turn up some credible-ish evidence that there are some scientists who you can argue, uh, you know, have play favourites uh, and so on and so forth. So the playbook's all kind of written out. And um, it's kind of easy, you know, you, you know what to do, you, you just so long as you can get a little bit of money from these very well, uh, from these very large cash flows, even though they're a tiny fraction of the economy, you can do what you need to do. So, um, so, so, so that's, um, uh, I don't know, I think that's a bit of a response to your, uh, well, it's a response to that question would a system which had more of what I'm talking about rise to these challenges? And I think it would it would kind of do it in a way that made everyone wonder what what was so hard about this. Um, uh, so, uh, so so that's um, that's kind of a bit of a, a spray on on those subjects. I, I, but when you talked about the House of Lords, um, let me take you through. Um, let me take you through a little sort of story about some thinking I've done on that subject. Before I do that, I'll mention to you, you talked about small, that this is a good way to run a small area. Well, we already do. East Belgium with 70,000 German speaking Belgians basically has the system I'm talking about. So it has a council of 50 people chosen at random, selected, they rotate every year. That body it doesn't have any deliberative function at all except to commission other bodies to do to so they might say we want someone to have a look at our health system they will commission a 50 person citizen juries to go and give them a report on the health system the original the, the main body that sits there is then responsible to try to hold the legislature to account because they manage this paper flow. It's quite like the Athenian bullae. Uh, so we, we actually do have one sort of working model of this, and it's really too early to tell you what its great successes and failures are, but we have a working model of it. Um, so Nicholas, before you yeah. talk about the House of Lords, and I suppose it yeah. sort of follows on from Alistair's question about chicken and egg, yeah. is actually how does this happen in this country if it's going to at all? And, and oh, in, in, in Britain? In and, Britain? Yeah, and when? Yeah. Okay, well, find me a friendly billionaire and we'll make it happen by next year. So notice how I said early on this, or this chamber need have no power. And I think I persuaded you that even with no power, it could have a transformative effect on democratic politics. Um, by transformative, I don't mean everything turns upside down. I just mean the biggest and healthiest shock it's had in a long time. 
And you can do all this with private money. So you get the money, you set up a governance process that people have confidence in, you get a respected retired conservative and a respected retired Labor person, a respected retired Liberal Democrat and some other worthies, and they become a governing council and they set this damn thing up. And everyone can see it and it will be newsworthy and it will be fascinating to watch the movement from the opinion of the people to the considered opinion of the people. And then we rotate people through the chamber every year. Uh, remember, Aristotle would call the systems we have in the West elected elective oligarchies. He would not call them democracies. He defined a democracy. I love this definition of democracy. It is a system in which people take turns in governing and being governed. And everyone should have a turn. Uh, and in Athens, they did have a turn because there were so many bodies that were chosen by sortition. You could yeah, have a... Half, you half could, of them, Nicholas, half of them. Meaning what? Sorry? Women didn't. Uh, yeah, well, I'm talking about citizens, but that's right. Uh, I, and no slaves and all the rest of it. So, so I'm not telling you they're great. I'm saying this system is a system that we can learn from. Um, and metics as well, who were foreigners, or even foreigners' children or their children's children. How anyone actually ultimately became Athenian, I'm not too sure. Um, yeah. yeah, so anyway, sorry, Maria. Uh, no, no, you... no, I, I was just going to say, um, I'm very conscious of time. Um, I just wanted to, to see if either you or anybody else had any final comments. Uh, be, before we sort of um, bring the discussion to a close. Well, I'm happy to go on, but I realise others, I mean, I've got these questions about the House of Lords I wouldn't mind saying a bit more about, yeah. but I realise, you know, the deal may be that everyone comes for an hour and they sh certainly shouldn't. Well, let, be let, let's be democratic. Um, we won't be able to overrun too long, but let's okay. be de yeah. democratic. Would you put your hand up, please, if you're, you'd like to continue for a little while longer? That looks like a yes to me. I think so. So shall we go for another five minutes or so sure. um, and see how things pan out? Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, so let me go on to the House of Lords. Um, the whole issue, uh, everyone who talks about sortition, this pro, you know, selection by lot or democracy by sampling, I'm the only person I know of who thinks that merit is a question that we should not have off the table. Uh, so, and let me tell you what happened in the South Australian Citizens Assembly on nuclear waste. 340 people uh, and they wanted to select spokespeople, but the people who were organizing it didn't want to have an election because this was showcasing a different way of doing things. So what they did was they got 10 people at random They uh, on the last day of the jury, which is a four-day jury, they got 10 people at random. They said to them, please come out of the jury for the uh, deliberation for the, for the next two hours. The first hour, you will choose the criteria according to which we should select spokespeople. And in the second hour, you will identify people you have met in the last three and a half days who meet those criteria. They produced, the, this is how they chose their spokespeople. It was extremely popular. It even had the icing on the cake that it was gender balanced, but that was not one of the criteria. Well, that's the best way to get gender balance, obviously. Uh, so, um, so, I mean, I think that mechanism is a, re, is, is a revelation because it shows that we can select for merit without predicating it all on self-assertion. And our entire system of merit selection involves people saying, I'm better than that other person. And how do you think people like Mal Meninga go in that? He's an incredible guy, but he does not feel comfortable doing that. And lots of women don't feel comfortable doing that. And if they aren't comfortable doing that, I don't want to make them do it. I want to recognise what they're great at. I want to change the method of a selection to... To, uh, to do that. Um, 
I always had this problem in my head that I, I don't like ignoring my lying eyes, you know, my eyes in front of me, I can see that the House of Lords produces better debates than most other legislative chambers in the world, but it's a kind of a joke that you should have this ancient aristocratic body. And so I have, uh, now this is really just a thought experiment, but I have a mechanism for you whereby we could reconfigure the House of Lords according to the sort of principles I'm talking about. How would I do that? I would ask the lower house to specify criteria of, um, of merit, criteria of distinction. They might say all captains of the English cricket team. They might say uh, prime ministers, uh, how members of the house, you know, members of the by House of Lords, I meant the old top of the judiciary. They might say people who've won the Nobel Prize. They might say professors. They might say people who are distinguished for making personal um, self-sacrificing contributions to their communities. I would ask them to, within these criteria, there might be 10,000 such people, and then I would select them, 100 of them, at random for terms in this newly configured House of Lords. What does that do? It completely gets rid of this thing that, you were, that, that we heard earlier, this idea of the career politician this idea that one is not doing one's best because one is building power, building our alliances, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, there are lots of, I, I mentioned that because we're sort of stuck in one way to think about a lot of these things. And when you see that this is just a kind of a, a different part of the repertoire that we barely, that we barely use, uh, things open up and I think we can do some, you know, we can come up with some really, really healthy new institutions. Thank you. Um, for any final comments before we wrap up? Because I, certainly for me, it's been a fascinating uh, discussion. No? Just, just add, no, I'll just say, I, I had a meeting yesterday with I'd mention his name, uh, Tory MP, Damien Collins. Seemed very pleasant. He was very frank and frankly awful, defending the indefensible. You have yeah. to be my local MP, but uh, enough said about that. You can't survive. You, can't su you cannot survive as a politician without being able to look into a camera and just say, Thing, just defend things that are utterly indefensible, utterly outrageous. Oh, good guy. I'm sure he's a good constituency MP. Yeah. Some of us may beg to differ, but there we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say I'd vote for him myself, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> uh, unfortunately, um, in the part of Kent that I live in, um, certainly for more years than I even care to think about, it's been conservative, no matter how you vote. So um, something wrong somewhere, but uh, enough of that. Um, any other further comments before we wrap up? Thanks very much, Nicholas. Good stuff. Great stuff. Well, Thank you, Alistair. I would like to say a huge um, personal thank you, but also a thank you on behalf of everybody who's been on the call today. Um, it's been a hugely thought provoking and interesting uh, discussion. Um, and I actually, for one, hope that it's something that we can move to uh, going forward because I don't think that the democracy that we currently have is representative of what I call your average person, if there is such a thing. It, um, it, and it breeds resentment and yeah. it's going to blow up. It's just too horrible. No, everyone knows that it, there's no real integrity in it. Well, um, perhaps my final thought, and it'd be interesting to see hear your response to that, is perhaps that would go some way to lessening the polarization that there are yeah absolutely it does to be not just in this country um but across the world um I, it's i mean if you what happens when you interview people who have been involved in these processes 
So think about the psychology. Firstly, you get a letter from the head of government saying, I'd like you to do that. So you feel flattered, which is ridiculous because you were chosen at random, but you feel flattered, you go along, and then you think, oh, God, this is politics. There'll be people outside with placards. People are going to yell at me. They go in. So there's not many of those sort of people usually. Sometimes there are. depends on how uh, controversial the topic is. Then they go inside, rather tense, and then they see other people like them. And they go, oh, they were, they're sort of worried. Oh, and then uh, what happens is that they find that they are subjected to views they've really never seen before. They've only seen caricatures of them because caricatures are much more entertaining. Uh, and if you're trying to set up a, you know, a five minute slot, you have the this side and the that side and possibly both sides are paid actors, if you like. They're paid spokespeople. Uh, the whole thing leaves you feeling unclean. And here you are, and somebody, and, and, and I mean, I won't go and get the quotes, but this was a citizen jury on Adelaide's nightlife. And a guy said, well, I turned up at this thing. I'm six foot two. I don't have any safety problems. And then I started talking to these two women who were scared. And so I thought, well, gee, I better help out with that. Well, that's not how it would be litigated on the radio. You would have the member from the Liquors and Allied Distributors Association saying, we want to open till 3 a.m. And that's good for jobs. And these people are a bunch of terrible people. And then the two women would be represented by some women's collective who would be sending newsletters out to their members saying, we got on the radio and we really stuck it to those people. And... And it's just a perfect way to get people fighting when they just don't need to fight. They, the, the other thing I'll say is that when you, when you um, exit poll these people, their opinion of politicians goes up because they go, oh, yeah, it's really hard. These decisions are hard. Um, yeah, I had the same problem my politician has. You know, those people want this and that seems fair enough and this seems fair enough too. So their opinion of politicians goes up, their opinion of bureaucrats goes up because they see that a lot of them are pretty hardworking and pretty trying to do the right thing. But the, their opinion of one institution, which is already low, falls further. And that's the media. Because when they see themselves reported in the media and little bits of the cherry pulled off the cake and stuck in the news story to rev it up a bit, they go, that's not what we were talking about. That doesn't represent us. That's not what this is about. That was some guy who got a bit, bit you know, that was the crossest thing he said all afternoon. And we settled him down or he ended up disagreeing, but we still had 80%. Usually these things go with 80% uh, consensus. I'm sure many of us could talk about this with you for hours. Um uh, again, a huge, huge thank you. It's been a real pleasure to meet you. Um, I'm going to hand back to Harry just to, to to finish off, if I may. But a huge thank you, Nicholas. Thanks, I'm gonna thank All I'm going to do is thank you all. Thank you very much indeed for being with us today. Thank you, Nicholas Gruen. Thank you for everybody that um, entered the debate. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Nicholas. Thank Thanks you very much. Thank you. If you want to get in touch, you can find me on the net. See ya. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. -bye.